So it's been a long week uh, in my sphere of the world. I don't know about yours. Uh, and uh, just a lot going on in the world around us, uh, a lot going on in, uh, well, our country, uh, you know, and all throughout, uh, all throughout the world, this, between this continuing war uh, in Europe and uh, just the violence here at home and uh, even reports this week uh, about our own Southern Baptist Convention that have some uh, really negative things in there that look really bad. Uh, just been a hard week. And then I was preparing to discuss this today in some capacity. And this morning we have uh, one of our own, Mr. Harvey Stacy, is uh, in the hospital right now. He was taken there by ambulance. So if you saw the ambulance there today, that's what that was about. I just want to remember him in our prayers. It's just, it's been a morning uh, and a week. And here's the thing I love about this. There's no safer place than God's church and specifically God's Bible uh, that you're free to express that things are hard, right? Life is hard. Things, hard things happen. You don't have to reconcile that. You don't have to, you know, have some sort of uh, happy, proverbial uh, ending uh, to the day. Uh, you can just live in the reality that life can be tough and life can be hard, and uh, it doesn't have to be more complicated than that. Uh, and the Bible knows this very well. Uh, and when so many biblical writers wrote, uh, especially in the book of Psalms, there's a whole category. The majority of the book of Psalms are what we categorize as a psalm of lament, of sadness, of just expressing grief that doesn't have a good little tidy bow on it, uh, just expressing that life's hard, things are hard. And uh, so I figured what we could do today uh, is read uh, from the book of Psalms, chapter 12, uh, a communal psalm of lament. So it'll be on the screen, I believe. Um, and so I would just encourage you to read along with me. Let's we'll start in chapter 12 in verse 1. Read the word of the Lord. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us, who is master over us. Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. And so in this psalm, you see a, a clear expression uh, that uh, evil is very real. And it's all around us. And um, our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is that these, uh, hopefully, uh, 80, 90, 100 years, if we're lucky, that we have here below are not all that there is. That there is an eternity that God will make everything right again somehow. We're going to talk about that a little bit today uh, in the sermon. Uh, but God's word is pure. Uh, it's refined, and uh, we can't pray anything back to the Lord better than what he has written for us. Uh, and so thank you for reading that with me. Let's uh, pray to the Lord now. Father, uh, as we come here today and we uh, bring whatever into this place, uh, we bring our joys and our highs, we bring our sorrows and the lows that we've experienced. But we come in here and we are unified by two things. The first of those is that we are sinful, uh, that we uh, stand before a holy God uh, condemned, both by your law and the law we make for ourselves. And yet, God, we also come in here and we are unified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that the same God whose law we have transgressed, whose sin that who we have sinned against, uh, that same God also reached down and entered into this world in the person of Christ Jesus. And in Christ, we now have a hope. And so we can confidently say that we will be delivered, that you will arise, that you will place us in the safety for which we long. 
God, our world is broken. Our world is sinful. We have contributed to that. We have messed up against your holy law and against your people. And we recognize, God, that not all of the world knows you like we do. And so we pray. We pray that you would soften hearts, that you would uh, make this society in which we live, this world in which we live, more receptive to the things of God, that your gospel would pierce that it would be the power unto salvation to all who believe. God, we know that specific communities in places like Buffalo, New York, and and Texas are hurting deeply right now, and we pray that you would give grace and comfort as only your Holy Spirit can. We pray, God, right now for those among our own congregation that are hurting right now. We pray for Mr. Harvey. We pray for others who have felt ill today pray for the many in this room that have brought their own burdens in here, weighted down by the things of this world. And God, I pray you would just lift that off of us, that we would look and see that your burden is easy. And so for this next little bit, God, in the midst of this grief, in the midst of lament, uh, would we look to you as the author and perfecter of our faith, and that there will be hope here today. And that that hope is a picture that uh, even if we have to return into the world right now, that there will be a day where Christ returns and the lion will lay down with the lamb. That you will wipe away every tear from our eye and all things will be made new. Lord, we long for that day. Lord, have mercy on us. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Listen, as landed. Lead us in worship. Let's all sing together.
Thank you, Landon. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that the words of that song are true. That we don't have to be the old man inside of us because he is dead and gone. Because your word tells us that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And I pray that if someone came into this room today still living in the chains of their past, or that they would let you take that Take those heavy chains, those stains that you covered white as snow, as your word says, Lord, and they can live in the victory of the saving work of Christ. Lord, as Brother Carter comes, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just speak through him or that you would open our ears that we can hear exactly what we need to hear out of this text today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be seated. If you have your Bible, you can turn with us to Genesis 19. If this is your uh, first time visiting with us, um, I apologize. Uh, it's going to get weird today. <laughs> uh, so we've been marching through Genesis, uh, and this uh, kind of had this day circled, uh, knowing that the subject material and what is in it uh, is interesting, to say the least. Uh, but again, one of the things I love uh, just about God's story is that uh, we read in the Bible and you read some stuff in there that, you, you know, if it's your first read through, you're kind of shocked if you just kind of this idea of Christianity is kind of this just morally, uh, you know, rule following thing. Uh, you come across these verses in the Bible where you're kind of shocked that that's in there. Uh, and you're kind of thinking, well, this is strange, you know, it. Our world today, there's a lot of uh, shocking things that you see on the news or you hear about, uh, but none more so than what you read about in Genesis. Uh, uh, just a strange collection of stories that force us to think outside of our nice little neat uh, paradigms that we've created for ourselves. Uh, and so it requires to be good critical thinkers. Uh, but when you come across a text like today's in Genesis 19, uh, these these pieces of the Bible, they challenge us, they shape us, and they push back a little bit on our natural inclination. So we talked about this last week, uh, that most religions in the world, uh, have, they've recreated gods that are essentially just extensions of themselves, uh, just some type of like maybe omniscient uh, version of themselves. And that is simply not the case in Christianity. Uh, there are parts, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, I don't know, uh, but there are parts of the Bible that I'm kind of not readily excited to think about. Um, there are commands in there and rules that at first glance, I, I maybe take a second look and wonder, I don't, that pushes back against some part of my life uh, and my natural inclination. And it corrects me and it shapes me and it, it molds me to look more like the person of Christ. And that's the point. That's the point of Christianity. It's the point of our faith is that we are not God ourselves. That we do not have it all figured out. That we are all in process. That we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so when you come across a text like Genesis 19 and you begin to wonder, what is this all about? Somehow, some way. It's pointing us to Christ Jesus himself. And so uh, strap in. Like I said, I, I make, I've apologized once. I won't do it again, all right? So if we get to the end of this sermon, you're like, that was bizarre. Uh, not what I expected when I showed up today. Uh, you've been forewarned. Uh, if you want, I'll pray. And if you want to exit at that point, uh, we'll all close our eyes and not see you. <laughs> Um, but anyway, throughout the book of Genesis, we've been talking about God's providence, this idea that he is purposefully sovereign, uh, so that there's no random accident in the world, uh, that uh, there's no such thing as, as God being out of control, uh, of not knowing what is going on. Now, this does not mean that God is responsible for sin. It does not mean that he's responsible for evil. Uh, what it does mean is that somehow, some way, in the long scope of eternity, uh, that he does have a way to work all this together for an ultimate good and glory. And when you say something like that in light of the last week, uh, that comes across as cold and callous. But when you really dig into the person and character of God, as we're going to do today, I think you begin to see that this God is good. 
and that can be trusted, and we can go take that to the bank. So uh, God's purpose, sovereignty, he comes to a guy named Abraham who does not know him, does not love him, and he tells him, Abraham, uh, even though you're older than dirt and your wife can't have kids, I'm going to form a great nation out of you. And so move from your homeland. So Abraham moves, uh, follows God. He believes in God. God takes Abraham's wife, Sarah, who the Bible says her womb was dead, uh, that she could not produce children. And by faith, uh, she and uh, Abraham conceived and uh, are going to have a child. That's a few weeks from now, okay? Make sure you come back on that, um, on that day. And so last week, we hone in on these visitors and they... God himself tells Abraham that he is going to let him know what's going on. He's going to tell him, uh, a peek behind the curtain, if you will. Uh, Abraham, here's what I'm about to do. And the reason why he says he's going to let him know this is because it is going to be Abraham's job and his lineage and then eventually the person of Jesus and on to all of those who would call upon his name. This giant story is so that God's people will learn how to do righteousness and justice. And so that's the point of all this. As we're reading this today, that needs to be in the background of your mind. uh, That this judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah passed down by God was so that God's people will understand justice and fairness and righteousness. Part of Abraham's covenant, you remember what God told him, is to bless the nations around him. To be a blessing to the nations. And so Abraham's job, one of the things he was supposed to do was the communities around him should uh, see the goodness, the righteousness that Abraham has, and they will be blessed by that. They will flourish. And so uh, and wrapped up in all that is today's message, judgment and deliverance. And the main idea of this message is this. God's judgment is sure, but so is his rescue. His judgment is sure, but so is his rescue. These two things are very complementary elements of God's character, his holiness, who he is. Um, and so if you've got Genesis 19, I'm going to read the entire uh, text for today, 1 through 29, uh, off the jump, and then we'll make just a few comments about it. Start with me in verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly, so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. And they called the lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we might know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place. Because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. As morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And as they brought them out, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills, lest the disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. 
And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley... God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So quite the story, quite the, the account. It happens like an action movie uh, playing out uh, in, in your mind. And so a lot goes on there and a lot happens and there's a lot in there. Now we could be here all afternoon uh, breaking this down. Uh, but to save us from doing that, uh, I think there are three general points uh, that we can kind of rest in. The first is this, that God is fair in his judgments. God is fair in his judgments. So the next two weeks, today and next week, uh, are not going to be good for uh, Abraham's nephew Lot. All right, if you don't know much about this guy, uh, you are not going to have a good opinion of him uh, after today or especially next week. Um, but we see this progression from him in this story. Chapter 13, he and Abraham separate. And remember where Lot goes? He looks and he says, oh, I can't believe Uncle Abraham's given me my selection of the land. I choose this good-looking property over here. Uh, Abraham's a, a dummy for letting me have that. And so he goes and says he pitches his tent toward Sodom. But then in chapter 14... Sodom gets taken away, gets taken captive uh, by some enemy kings, and Lot gets swept up in that. He's in the city at this point. So he moves uh, on the outskirts, and now he's in the city. And when we pick up in this text, you see that he is at the city gate. He's a judge in the city. So he is now a leader in Sodom. Perhaps an economic advisor, maybe just a legal judge, whatever the case may be, he is in a place of prominence he sits here and these two angels enter the city in the town square. And you can go back to last chapter and this chapter and kind of look at how Lot and Abraham play off each other. So Lot offers his hospitality. He wanted them to stay at his house. He had learned from his uncle Abraham to be a good host. The angels initially refused, which I think is a really interesting point. I'll return to that in just a second. This says that Lot presses them. Now that's the same word that's going to be used in a minute about the mob pressing in on Lot. So it's not just that he was verbally insistent, but it appears to be that he is uh, quite uh, over the top, almost to the point of potentially strong-arming them, having to wrestle them, push them into his house. Why would Lot do this? Is it because he just wanted to be the most hospitable person in the world? I mean, is he a violent host, all right? I don't know about you. I've never uh, wrestled someone to my dinner table uh, just for the honor of hosting them. And Lot sets out here and basically shoves these guys into his house. Why is that? We think that Lot probably knew what was going on in the town square at night. He probably knew what was going to happen to two uh, heavenly messengers. The Bible doesn't really describe their physical appearance. Uh, but something tells me that God wouldn't send two ugly guys uh, or weak guys or whatever it might be. Instead, these guys appear in the town square and Lot knows this is going to get ugly. And so he forces him in his home. He treats him to a hasty meal. And so what's going on here? Well, I think a key point raised by interpreters and commentators is this. God is investigating. God is investigating Sodom at this point. All right, several hundred years from now, uh, Moses would write down the law. And uh, in Deuteronomy, he says that uh, evidence needs to be based on two or three eyewitness testimonies. And so I think God in his uh, never-changing character is showing Abraham I'm going to judge the world with equity. I'm not going to be distant from this sin. I'm not going to be just arbitrarily handing out judgments. But I'm going to send my own messengers down there to experience this. And on their two testimonies, their judgment will be sure. Now, does God know that Sodom is wicked? Well, absolutely. He's omniscient. He's God. He knows everything. But he's doing this in a human expression to show Abraham this is what is going to happen. 
He's giving evidence of the holiness that he possesses. And I think this is why the angels initially refused the offer. They're here to check out Sodom. They, they wanted to experience that evil so that they could then issue a fair judgment. Let's talk about that word for a second, fairness. All right, we're learning all about that in my household. Uh, what's fair and what's not amongst my kids. I heard a guy once say that uh, he, had a, he had several kids and uh, one of them said something about fair and that became a buzzword in their house. Well, this isn't fair, that's not fair. And he said he realized he had been a bad pe- dad at that point because he had somehow made them think that the world would be kind and fair to them. So he said his solution was that he would stop by a convenience store on the way home and buy one single candy bar. And when he entered into the household, by random selection, he would choose one of those children, hand him the candy bar. And when the other siblings would say, What's, you know, what are you doing? That's not fair. I didn't get any candy. He'd say, well, life's not fair. Get used to it. I don't know if that's good parenting. I don't know if they had to go to counseling later on in life. I have no idea. Uh, But life is not fair, right? But our sense of fairness, our sense of what is good and what is fair is certainly skewed, right? Like, so we all have this concept of fairness in our minds, but that's all based on our experiences, what we think is best. And all of us have blind spots and all of us have reasons to be inconsistent in our fairness. But what God is showing us is I am fair. There is no inconsistency in me. I am the one that is coming down here to show you that I will see this evil up close and personal. And I can't help but see the same display of fairness and equity in the person of Jesus Christ. Is God fair? I think he is. The only unfairness in him is lobbied against himself and not us. It's unfair that Christ got my unrighteousness and I got his righteousness. We see one perfect man that lived sinlessly yet suffered incredibly. Christ, though equal with God, did not count that equality as a thing to be grasped, but instead emptied himself, wrapped himself in flesh, and exposed himself to the evil of this world. That, to me, is unfair. And so in Christ, because of his witness here below, none of us can claim innocence. Just as these angels witness and experience the evil of Sodom, and their destruction, its destruction was completely justified, Christ's life shows that God is fair. Can you imagine making an excuse before Jesus about why you sinned, right? Like I was hungry and Jesus says, oh yeah, like that time I didn't eat for 40 days and nights and yet I remained faithful. Like could you imagine sinning before Jesus? Uh, Jesus, the devil made me do it. And Jesus is like, uh, yeah, remember the time I spoke to the devil face to face and he was tempting me and giving me all these things? We have no excuse before God. No one has witnessed the evil and cruelness of this world more than Christ himself. No one suffers in God's story more than God does. He is routinely rejected. And then when Christ comes to earth, he himself is rejected and beaten and murdered, scourged for us. And so there is no excuse. God is fair in his judgments. You see, my sin, your sin, the world's sin against the holy God, he knows all of this, and he can so easily strike that down. You got financial issues? Remember what Christ said? The Son of God doesn't have a place to lay his head. You got family issues? Mark 3, Jesus' family comes to steal him away because they say he's out of his mind. The world's ugliness, I think Christ knows a thing or two about how cruel people can be. God is supremely aware of the sins of the world. And so when this fire and this brimstone starts raining down on Sodom and Abraham, you just get this picture of him looking down at it. It is totally justified. It is fair. And when each of us is condemned by our sin, it is completely fair and righteous. I mean, imagine standing before God one day and not having Christ as your intermediary. What would you say? Romans 1 and 2 are these incredible chapters in the New Testament that say to the Jewish people, they have sinned against the Jewish law. Everyone has violated that law. And then in Romans, he says, in those that don't have the law, they've made a law unto themselves. Everybody who doesn't have the Jewish law has still got some sort of moral code, and they have violated that. No one is righteous. And so when Christ and God, who are the same, 
When they issue judgment, it is fair and it is righteous. Compared to that, we see in this story that humanity is unrighteous. Number two. So the story moves forward and it gets pretty disturbing from here out. The men of the city come to see these angels. They say they want to know them. Very biblical expression for uh, uh, sexual relations. The men of Sodom have obviously deviated from God's natural design for sexual relations to be between a man and a woman in covenant marriage. I think additionally though, perhaps the, the worst part of this is that this is an attempted sexual assault. They want to force themselves on these men. Sodom's sin is more than this though. Isaiah equated it with not caring for widows and orphans. He says that Israel is being worse than Sodom for their rejection of the oppressed in their community. Jeremiah says that this is adultery. Ezekiel stated that Sodom's pride, their excess, their decadence, that was their sin. This is punctuated by these phrases, right? It says, every man in this town, young and old, Why does he say that? Because he's showing here every single person in Sodom is wicked. There is none righteous there. The whole city, the totality of Sodom's inhabitants are wicked. And so Lot attempts to intercede. He steps in. It's like, oh man, this guy's got a lot of honor, right? Wrong. Lot is righteous somehow, some way. Second Peter calls him that. Uh, But I'm going to tell you, now I am not... Uh, a very sanctified person. Uh, (laughs) uh, When I get to heaven, I hope I'm completely sanctified because if I see Lot, I'm going to be real opposed to him. Uh, Like we're going to cross each other in heaven or in the new creation and I, it's going to take Jesus' blood to keep me from wanting to go just like wring this guy's neck. Plus, uh, men at the time were between the sizes of like 4'10 and 5'5, and uh, so I would dominate him, okay? So I'm going to need Jesus' power to hold me back from saying, what is the matter with you? What does he do? He offers up his two virgin daughters as intercession. Don't, Don't bother the men, have my daughters. So yeah, some honor, I suppose, in there that you don't want the men to be violated, but how about your own flesh and blood underneath your own roof? This place is wicked indeed. The men comically have to come out and rescue Lot. He's getting pressed in. They strike the men blind, and the men still grope for the door. Even in their blindness, it doesn't exhaust their desire to sin. Left to our own devices, even when we know our sin is bad, even when we know that it hurts us and other people, we return to it. As the proverb says, like a dog returns to its vomit. Sodom's sin is a complete and total wickedness. It says the outcry against them. You hear that last chapter and in this one. The outcry against them. And the idea behind all of this is that there are victims. That sin is never isolated. That unrighteousness is never an isolated thing. That when you sin, when I sin, there is always a transgressed party. First of all, the Lord himself. But second of all, a human being is hurt. And most often, multiple human beings. This whole idea, like one of the most beautiful things about the the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish faith, is that it is an intensely communal faith, right? And so that's one of the reasons why we want to uphold that one of our core values here is that we are, uh, we believe in God's people, right? It's not just that it's, oh, my individual faith, Jesus is going to come back for me. No, that's not true. He's going to come back for his church, a church collection of people all across the world throughout time and history and sin against one individual pollutes the entire community it has ramifications and consequences there is no such thing as an isolated sin there's no such thing as a victimless sin And so when you see this outcry, it's not just these two men in this one story, but it's everyone who's been oppressed in this place. And one of the reasons why sin and wickedness are so bad is because it harms everyone. Unrighteousness shakes its fists at a holy God, but it breaks down everyone around it. Our world is sinful, we're sinful, and we deserve that judgment from a fair and righteous God. Let me take a second to address this report that came out last week about our own Southern Baptist Convention a convention that I love, a convention that I've been a part of my whole life. And if you're unfamiliar, you can go home and look it up. Feel free to send me any questions you have. 
Uh, but over the last year, there's been an investigation into the cover-up of sexual abuse that has happened throughout churches, uh, both in the Southern Baptist Convention and not. Now, if you don't know what any of this means, um, the simplest way to put it is this. Uh, you don't have to worry about this church. I can't control what goes on in other churches, but I know that our church is good, all right? Well, we're not good uh, in the righteous sense of the word. We're good because of Christ, but there's no uh, cover-up going on here whatsoever. But our church is in cooperation with other Baptist churches, and we pool our money together for missions and other things. And what we found out in this report is that uh, a group of lawyers and uh, more business-minded people, and that's a slight to some people in here, <laughs> uh, there has been legal decisions made to protect liability instead of moral decisions made to confront sin, to oppose sin, and to uh, bring justice to those who have been sinned against. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I've had people ask me, well, shouldn't we just move past this? Well, abuse victims can't move past it. They can begin the healing process for sure, but it lives on. And so sin must be confronted. It must be investigated. This report is necessary because there are ongoing consequences. There's trauma. There's hurt. It invades everything around us. The depravity of human being creeps its way into the framework of our lives. And so, yes, this is a black eye, and we deserve it. Now, we are not complicit. I don't know anybody complicit in any of the sin in this report. But I know that we are now responsible for working together to see that no Baptist church has a, a case of abuse in it. And certainly, if one does happen, that justice is brought there. And so as we sit here, it's easy to judge Sodom thousands of years ago sitting in this room right now, but the reality is that Sodom is still around us. It's easy to judge the residents of Sodom, but you and I have dwelt there before, and save for the blood of Jesus would still be residents in that community of unrighteousness. So from our religious institutions to our government, to our elementary schools, from our economic system to our homes to our world, every human being is utterly sinful that makes these things up. I don't have to dig up headlines. I don't have to make you all aware of the darkness in the world. A world full of sinful people doing their best, left to their own devices, seem bent on destructions. When you read in the book of Colossians that all things are held together by Jesus and for Jesus, there, that's the only way this world would still hold together. That it's God's common grace that we can be at peace long enough to know Christ and then begin being peacemakers in the world around us. If we can have a moment of striking self-reflection, we have all contributed our fair share to the brokenness of this world. Humanity is unrighteous. But here's the beauty. God is faithful to judge, and he is faithful to deliver. The story goes on, all right? So the angels pronounce judgment. They've seen all they need to see, right? And they give Lot this incredible opportunity. And I think this happens for one of two reasons, uh, maybe both. First of all, this is, I think, for the sake of Abraham's prayers in chapter 18. If you know of somebody who is in a, a sinful uh, life cycle, somebody who can't seem to get it all together like uh, Abraham's nephew Lot couldn't, don't stop praying for them. Don't stop praying that God would deliver them. Don't stop praying that God would intercede in their life. Because I think that that is one of the main, you read in verse 29 that on the sake of Abraham, that's one of the reasons why Lot was saved. Pray, pray for people. Pray for people that are hurt. Pray for people that are in uh, self-destruction. Pray. That was you at one time. And then secondly, somehow, some way, uh, Lot is righteous. Second Peter chapter 2 says that Lot was righteous. He hated the sin that was going on around him. Um, again, uh, don't anticipate, don't look forward to seeing Lot uh, in the next life. Uh, but somehow, some way, he did believe God, that he did count God as uh, true and righteous. He had faith of some capacity. But here's the thing about him. He's got to be dragged out of the city, right? So he goes to his son's-in-law, and his son's-in-law thinks he's uh, a mocker, that he's joking. Uh, and they make light of the judgment. Verse 16, the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand. And here's what I love, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. You and I in Christ need to remember these two things. In repentance and hating our sin and turning towards the Lord, our sin is canceled by the atoning work of Christ on the cross. 
You know the song well. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. But secondly, our attachment to Christ loops us into this inheritance and we become God's people. We're grafted in on the basis of our faith and we get set outside the judgment of God on the basis of his divine deliverance. So this story plays out quickly. It's, like I said, it's an action movie. And as sweet and sure as Lot's deliverance is, as he is rescued, uh, God's judgment is also reigning around. So he gets this, uh, you know, the angels give him the run for your life cue in the movie. Uh, and they all start scrambling. Only his wife doesn't quite make it. She looks back. The scriptures say. So what's this all about? I saw a movie once, some made-for-TV, uh, B-rated thing, you know, probably more like C or D-rated movie. Uh, and uh, Lot's wife turns back, and it was in the early 2000s, so, you know, computer animation was uh, left a lot to be desired. And uh, it's just awful. Uh, it's like this, uh, her bite starts at her toes, you know, salt just like creeping up over her whole body or whatever. And... Uh, I didn't even write that down. I wasn't supposed to say this today. But anyway, uh, just terrible. What did that look like, right? What did that appear? Uh, how did that all play out? Well, this is one of those deals where the Hebrew conveys a lot more than English does. The idea here is that she looks back, uh, not just like physically turns back to see it, but potentially begins moving back that direction. At the very least, her heart, her soul, she didn't want to leave Sodom. She didn't want to be with Abraham. She desired to remain in or with Lot, she desired to remain in Sodom. She didn't want to be delivered. She didn't want to be rescued, and her heart did not want the things of God. And so she doesn't escape judgment. Meanwhile, the city burns, just total destruction, fire, ash, smoke, and Abraham stands above it all, looking down. You remember the whole point of this story? It said Abraham is to learn righteousness, to pass it down to his people. And I guarantee you, when Abraham went to bed that night, he thought the Lord means what he says. That the Lord is righteous and that the Lord should be taken seriously and that judgment is a very real concept. And so I think the lesson for us is certain, it's similar. Get out of Sodom. Forsake the unrighteousness of living for ourselves, of indulging ourselves. Faithfully follow the Lord. Intercede for others. Help them to escape the impending judgment coming. So, all right. We'll, uh, we'll clutch down for a second. <laughs> God's wrath and his judgment is a concept and a doctrine that is not always popular. Right? Doesn't strike up a crowd. If you're having a, con a conference of some sort and you went out, hey, everybody come by, I'm going to talk about hellfire and brimstone. Uh, uh, you may get a crowd, I don't know, I, I doubt it though. Not a popular doctrine. And I think one of the reasons is this. We think, who am I to pass judgment? I shouldn't judge other people. And we think that because we inherently know that we are not righteous, we are not worthy in and of ourselves. But God, well, God doesn't have to ask that question. He is totally fair. He is totally just and righteous. And so when God says judgment is coming, he means that that's fair on his part. You see, God's judge, his justice has to be met. If it's not, he is not trustworthy and good. Right? Like if I have a rule established for my children and one of them breaks that rule and I don't enforce it, I have just revealed to them that I'm not all good and all trustworthy. And that I will allow certain things to be bad and, sin, and uphold other things. I'm inconsistent. You and I need God's judgment and his sure uh, judgment of the world. Because without that, there's no guarantee that he means what he says. But there's another reason for it. Somehow in the eternity to come, judgment means that everything will be made new. Justice means that the demands will be met and that somehow, some way, all things are working together. And so when you read in the book of Revelation that every tear will be wiped away and that all things will be made new, somehow, some way, the sin, the transgressions, mine, yours, the whole world, will be rectified in some way that will lead and produce an eternal weight of glory. This past week... Uh, I, I, I've, I've 
kept up with this shooting in Texas to the extent that my soul can bear it. So I'm not as up to date as maybe some of you are. And I hate the way that, and it's one of the reasons I love a psalm of lament, is that it's just a space to, instead of immediately go into the news or to social media, the, the, a psalm of lament just allows you to just recognize, this is hard. This is bad. This is evil. And I can just live with that for a while. Instead of having to fire off a hot take or some opinion or whatever it may be. I'm glad for God's judgment. All right, I'll say it. I'm, I'm stepping outside of the bounds of, of the authoritative scriptures of God, okay? So if this is wrong, um, God, don't strike me, right? If I'm being honest, it seems like this guy got off easy. Like, it, it seems like the blood of 21 people demands more than what this guy got. That, like, his suffering should be worse than, than just an instant death. And how, how, how do you work that into God's judgment? How do you work that into a good and holy God? Well, I think an eternal judgment against him is how you do that. I think that this guy has not gotten away with anything. And I think that a holy and a righteous God who loves children and loves teachers and loves anybody that didn't, doesn't deserve to be murdered, I think that that God holds their tears and their cries in his soul. And I think that that shooter is facing the wrath of God right now, and I'm glad for that. And if I'm glad for that, then I've got to be glad that God's justice is perfect and that it extends to more than just a murderer. I've got to be glad that his justice extends to the greed in my own heart, the frustration, the anger, the pride that I feel, the sense that I know best, my transgression, my sin. If I want God to judge that man's sin, then I've got to want him to judge total sin. Do I like that? No. But is that consistent? Yes. So when you read a text like this and you wonder, what is this all about? Well, it means this. No evil ever goes unpunished. No one gets away with anything. That a holy and a righteous God is still holy and righteous. He was thousands of years ago when he judged Sodom and Gomorrah, and he is still holy and righteous today amongst us. I said this last week. God judges sin in only one of two ways. He judges it through eternal damnation, separation from his goodness. He judges it on himself, on the Lord Jesus Christ, who nailed to a cross, took the wrath reserved for me and took the wrath reserved for you. In repentance, turning to him, trusting him, despising the sin around you in your own life and in the life around you, putting your faith in that man and that, hey, I don't understand how all this is going to work out, but I put my trust in this good and sovereign God. In so doing, your sin has been canceled and Christ got your wrath and you get his inheritance. And through his resurrection, we live again and in his return Whenever that may be, we will see victory. And whatever blood cries out, cries out from the ground, whether it be from Sodom, whether it be from Texas, whether it be from Hardin County, Tennessee, God will make good on that. I don't know 100% how, but I trust him. I have faith, and that's about all I can offer him. Somehow, way, in the fire and sulfur of Sodom, Christ is still beautiful. That that's where we see Christ maybe most beautiful. That's where we see him making all things new from a tree nailed to for my sin and yours. And it doesn't matter my righteousness, my best. I've got no standing before him that could earn anything. My nationality, my goodness, my bank account, my anything I can offer. 
God says, you're either covered by my son's blood or you were judged. So this is heavy. So what I want to do is this, okay? I'm going to pray. I'm going to take a deep breath and then pray. And uh, then we're going to worship. We'll sing a song. And uh, what I want you to do during that time is just, first of all, pray to the Lord in a sense of a lament that this world is hard, that things are hard, and just recognize that. Maybe just pray to God and, and, and think through that for a minute. Uh, and then just ask yourself, is there anywhere where I'm wanting to linger in Sodom? Is there anywhere that I need to confess to the Lord anything that is wrong in my life that I need to not look back but move towards deliverance? If there's anything else you'd like to talk to me about, feel free to come forward, feel free to come and pray, whatever it may be. But this is a wonderful time to talk to the Lord and to engage with Him um, as we close. Let's pray. Father, I confess that this text is long and hard and dense and there's a lot there and I'm not even sure I really got the most out of it. But I know this, your judgment is sure. We have earned that from our sin and our transgression, but so is your deliverance. And that sin and lostness and, and evil in my own heart and in the world around me, that, that drives me to a place of seeing Christ as more beautiful than ever, that he would forsake the comfort of heaven and enter into this world clothed in flesh, God himself come to earth. And so from that smoke of my own life, from the unrighteousness in my own heart, I see the beauty of the cross. Broken by my sin, the cross looks more beautiful than ever. And so God, I pray that you would do something in the hearts of us in this room today. Help us to, to see that your justice is an extension of your goodness. And therefore we will love Jesus all the more and be more conformed to his image. May we just search our own hearts right now, God. Would you search us and try us and know our anxious thoughts? Would we offer them to you in this time? I ask these things in Christ's name, amen.